Uh, what we're going to do, do now is I'm going to ask uh, Davis uh, to come up and join me. And uh, Davis and uh, Ray and I, uh, each are going to take about 15 minutes just to share uh, some of our experience uh, in, uh, in leadership. And some of this is, is certainly in home education organization leadership, but I think in other organizations as well. Now, did, we, did we decide who was going first? We no. didn't? No. Well, Ray, your computer's already here. Okay. I won't be using the computer for this. <laughs> is that on now? Okay. Um, as uh, when Gerald asked us to uh, prepare some topics on leadership, one of the things I thought might be helpful is talking about the difference between leading homeschoolers and leading homeschool leaders. And those are very different things. And those of you who are organizing a, a country organization, you'll often be working with other homeschool leaders in your country, and there's some different challenges. Uh, when working with homeschoolers, they typically are looking for support. They're looking for encouragement. You're going to be focused at a family level normally, talking to moms, talking to dads, uh, explaining to them how to homeschool, as I said, encouraging them as they're homeschooling, giving them uh, guidance and direction. By the time you're now leading homeschool leaders, they usually don't need that. Often they've already been leading a small support group or, or some other group. They've been involved in the homeschooling, homeschooling movement. So they, they have the vision, they have the passion, they already know where they want to go. Your bigger question or issue with leading homeschool leaders is keeping them aligned with the vision of your organization. Uh, and they're ensuring that you've got clear boundaries for them, how far they can go, how far or what they, they should or should not be doing. We had a, a problem on one of our organizations uh, at one point when one of our board members wrote an excellent letter to the uh, uh, editor of the largest newspaper in the state dealing with a, a very important issue. It wasn't a homeschooling issue, uh, but it was a very important issue in the state. And then he signed it with his name and then board member of our organization. And we told him, Jack, you can't do that. We, we've never even talked about this as a board. We probably all would agree with you, but this is not an issue for our organization. He said, well, yeah, but that gave me more status and more credibility. He said, I don't care. It's not something that our organization, it's not part of our vision. It's not something that we need to engage in. And it created quite a problem. And he's saying, well, I'm on the board and I should be able to say what I want. Yes, but uh, you can have an opinion. But when you now say you're speaking for the board, you're speaking for the organization, you need to make sure you have the entire organization behind you and aligned. And that can be a problem when leading homeschool leaders because all of us as homeschool leaders, we're bold, we're independent, uh, we're ready to be out front doing whatever we need to do. Uh, and, and you will often find that then some people will get uh, off a little bit and they'll start going on a tangent, going in a different direction. You have to keep bringing those back. And so uh, you've heard today several times the importance of having a vision for your homeschool organization Absolutely, you need to have that. And if the people in your organization are not in agreement with that vision, then um, there's only two options. Either they leave um, or they change. Those are the only two options. Uh, just one other uh, comment along that with, uh, with that home school, that vision for your organization. We had a problem in the, the organization I'm in right now not long ago where some of the people who had been long time uh, part of our staff um, they didn't agree with the direction that the organization was going because we were making a change. And we, they, they had been in full agreement with the original vision and had been very supportive and we were key, key pillars of the organization. But when we made a change of essentially going to a, a, a much more electronic, uh, internet-based type of organization, uh, rather than doing everything in, in paper and everything in the, the way we'd done it in the past, but really trying to actually move out of the 1990s up into the 2000s. Not all the way up to the, 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 the 2010s. We were just trying to get to the 2000s. Um, and, uh, and they didn't agree. They, uh, they had problems with that, and it created a major problem. We should have recognized it sooner, quite frankly. Uh, and that can be a problem when they don't have the shared vision uh, that's your biggest challenge when leading leaders. When leading homeschoolers, your biggest challenge is normally encouraging them, motivating them, 
Uh, they're, uh, especially their first few years when they're fearful. Uh, another comment I wanted to make is the difference between leading a volunteer organization versus an organization with paid staff. Uh, when you're working with volunteers, um, they will overcommit and underperform. That's a reality. You know, as much as we wish that wasn't the case. Now, that's a, that's a generalization. You will have some volunteers who will absolutely blow you away. They will come through and, and just do so much great stuff, and you just go, wow. But in general, volunteers will overcommit and underperform. I recall one convention we had a volunteer who was going to be at our registration desk, and, and she had said, yes, I'll be there. So it's time for to start the convention. She shows up for registration. She says, oh, by the way, uh, I can only stay for an hour uh, because, you know, I've got this and I've got that and all these other things. It's a two-and-a-half-day convention, and she's going to be there for an hour. Uh, the, so the, that will often happen. Um, so find people, if you can, find people to, for volunteering who are passionate about the type of, of thing you're asking them to do. What is something that they do well? Uh, if you're looking for people to write blogs or to write articles for your newsletter, who's somebody who likes to write? Use them. Uh, now, you may have to edit it first or at least can give them the specific topics you need at first to get them focused. But use the people's skills, uh, or the volunteers, use the skills. Let them essentially help choose what they want to do. You'll have some people who will say, I'll do anything you want. And that's great. I need those because I'm going to put them into all the holes. But, in, but I, where I have people saying, well, I can't do this or I can't do that. Well, what could you do? What you can do, then use them for that. Um, also, with volunteers, um, since you're not giving them any other compensation, give them lots of praise, lots of glory. Uh, you know, list their names in the newsletters or on the website. Thank them publicly. Uh, give them that recognition. Uh, make them know that they are very, very appreciated. Now, when you're dealing with paid staff, a little bit different issue. Um, there, um, make sure they understand, the, as I mentioned, the vision. They understand the vision, understand what they're, we're asking them to do. But the key with paid staff is that they have a servant mindset, uh, a customer service mindset, that, that they don't come into things thinking, well, I'm the expert, and they have to do what I tell them to do because I'm the expert. I've seen that problem with paid staff. I've also seen the problem with paid staff of someone who's just, I'm just here for the job, you know, just for the get the get the money, get the paycheck. I don't really want to do anything. I don't really want to answer the phone. Don't really want to uh, work these issues. So you want someone who who really believes in homeschooling. You probably aren't paying them well, so hopefully they have some passion to go along with it. I wish we could pay our paid staff better, um, but. Like many organizations, we, we don't have lots of extra resources lying about. Um, and again, paid staff, be prepared to let them go if, if uh, you need to. And that was already mentioned that uh, uh, someone had mentioned uh, hire slow, fire fast. Uh, I think that's, that's definitely a, a true thing with staff because a, a, a bad staff member will create all kinds of a, a cancer and rot that then goes out through the whole homeschooling organization tarnishing your organization's image. Um, last point I wanted to make about uh, the leading with, with others and leading with the, within the organization is when do we want to affiliate with other organizations? Uh, and that is on, on what issues? We're the homeschoolers. Well, what about some of the other pro-family organizations? And, and Arena gave a great uh, uh, talk about working with the church. And in some cases, I've been able to work with churches, but in some cases, the churches didn't agree with us. Uh, in some cases, there have been other pro-family groups uh, that want to work with us, but some not. Uh, we've had an interesting um, uh, interactions with the private school movement over the years. The private school folks are with us on some education issues because they also want to have the government leave them alone, but we're competition. And so they're saying, you know, all those homeschoolers, they ought to be in my private school instead. So we, we have to, to, to look at that. So when you're working with other organizations, make it clear that you want to work together on issues that we can agree on. But if it's an issue that we don't agree on, we're not saying you're a bad person. It's just not our issue. We're going to be focused on homeschooling, parental rights, uh, that, that type of an education model. That's what we're working on. Everything else... You know, bless you, do what you need to do. Um, I'll just use it as an example. We had in Connecticut at one point, we were working with some legislative stuff, 
And the, the people who were um, uh, very libertarian, it's a, a phrase used in the U.S. Of, of folks who don't want government involvement in anything, they were right there with us. Great. And then they said, now will you guys join us as we get drugs legalized? And we said, no. <laughs> Um, whether, you, whether you're in favor of legalizing drugs or not, it's just that's not a homeschooling issue, and we're not even going to go down that path. That's, we just, we'll deal with the things that are important to us. So join together. You're not signing a contract. You're not marrying these folks. You're working together for a common goal, but make clear what that goal is when you're working with other organizations. Okay, that's my part. I'll turn it back over, Gerald, to, to you. And well, thank you, Ray. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll just keep, uh, keep on and uh, have a question and discussion time at the end. Uh, Davis, uh, you're using PowerPoint for yours? I can. We can, yeah, I can connect to it. Yep, we can, we can do a switch over. Yep. really fun when you do one slide from one presentation, one from the other, and just go back to that. Slide. You've, you've done that, I take yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was interesting. Okay. Well, first of all, let me ask uh, this question. Has anybody in this room ever had a fight with anybody? I'll wait till everybody tells the truth. <laughs> right, you, you have a family, don't you? Okay, so if you have a family, you know that you're gonna be in conflict with people you love. Okay, now put yourself on a board with strangers that you maybe haven't spent a lifetime with, or maybe you're working on, been working together for a long time, you're going to have disagreements. You're going to have differences of opinions, and you're going to have to figure out how to deal with conflict. So I have four ideas and lessons <laughs> that I've learned in the trenches. This is uh, uh, from family, from organizations, from business. When the conflict happens, how do you avoid the combativeness, being in combat with one another? Because conflict is not necessarily bad. Matter of fact, confrontation could be a bad word for half of you, depending on your personality, and a lovely word for the other half. Let me, real quick on my personal experience, I grew up in a family that didn't talk. And when we did, we had one conversation that was the only chance you had. I married a wife who talked all the time. She's not Italian, but the next closest thing. She was a little louder than I was in those conversations. And she was very opinionated, just like me. I was the quiet version of opinion. She was the loud version of opinion. And through just my marriage growth and learning through that, I learned that confrontation is actually not a bad word. And when I practiced it the first few times, I was very nervous and scared. But as I saw the benefits, I realized it's actually healthy. So. Lesson number one in conflict resolution is just pick up the phone. Way too often, I will get a phone call or I'll get a, a you know, one of my children will come to me and they'll say, S my brother's being mean to me. Well, have you talked to them? Oh well, no, but he's being mean. You go talk to him, dad. And you have to teach your children how to go talk to the person they have a problem with. The same thing with other board members, other uh, employees, other team members. If somebody comes to you and says, I just don't think that they're thinking right on this issue, you've got to set them straight on this. You be the one to help learn healthy conflict resolution and say, have you talked to them yet? Have you picked up the phone and called them to say, I see this differently than you? We will all be surprised how quickly that can often solve the problem. I love it, and this has happened many times, when someone has called me saying, I, you need to talk to this person, it's not working out, and I say, well, have you talked to them? Well, no. Well, I think you should. I don't think it's gonna be as bad as you think it is when you call them. And I'll get a phone call an hour later saying, Davis, you were right. I picked up the phone call, we're already friends, we just see, uh, have a difference of opinion on this issue, and through a 15-minute conversation, 
they're fine. And, and why is that? It's because when you're looking at somebody face to face or when you're actually on the phone with somebody, you watch your tone a little bit. You watch your body language. You don't actually say those things you think you're so brave to say because you're a kind person. You're considerate. You actually do like this person. You want to work with them. But so often, we don't pick up the phone. Just pick up the phone and talk to that person first. Lesson number one. Lesson number two, affirm the relationship. Now, this can sound very easy and obvious, but this is where I know I've messed up sometimes. Because here's how I uh, deal with conflict often. OK, I have a problem with somebody, so I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to be mature, and I'm going to go talk to them. All right, got lesson number one figured out. And then I say, OK, I need to let them know I'm not their enemy. So I'll shake their hand, give them a hug, say, hey, I really appreciate what you did here, but can we talk about this other issue? And what I just did is I affirmed the relationship for about five seconds. Affirming the relationship, you need to spend a little bit of time there. How, how are things going? What, what's going on in the family? Are there other issues in life? Just basically having a friend conversation. Making sure that before you go to step three, that you are absolutely sure you're still friends. And they don't see that you just came to solve a problem, you know, get past the pleasant trees real quick, let's get to the issue. Take your time here. Make sure you really let them know you care about them, that you care about your organization, and that you care about their opinion when you get to the more difficult parts of the conversation. Lesson three, I th I'm going to change the title of this at some point. I say know and love these people. Here's what I really mean. Be aware of yourself and be aware of the person you're talking to. Now, th there's a, a, a resource that I'll show you at one of my uh, ending slides called Emotional Intelligence. It's a book, Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Now, we all talk about IQ. We know that that's typically how smart is a per person naturally. Problem with IQ is what you were born with is what you get. Not a whole lot you can do to get smarter. But what's called EQ, emotional quotient, your emotional intelligence, is actually where most people find success. Most of the successful people in the world by worldly standards have high EQs high emotional intelligence. There's many people that are wildly successful in the world that don't necessarily have the highest IQs, but they are good with people. And that's what a high EQ is. They are self-aware. They know their own personality. They know that, okay, I'm a task-oriented person and I'm about to talk to a people-oriented person. I better ask how their family's doing instead of just getting right to the task and vice versa. If you're a reserved person and you're about to talk to a very outgoing person, you better pick up the energy a little bit. That's being aware of yourself, being aware of the other person and adjusting accordingly. Knowing yourself, knowing the other person. There's another uh, resource I'll give you um, from Ken Sandy. It's called Relational Wisdom. RW360, and I think it's .net, you'll see it in a little bit. But it's a similar concept to emotional intelligence. However, he adds a third component, and that's being God-aware. What does God want in this conflict? What does God want in this relationship? And then mixing those three, being self-aware, other-aware, and God-aware, makes for a beautiful amount of wisdom in developing healthy relationships and solving problems like this. And fourth and final lesson is seeking to understand. And you see the hand by the ear. This boils down to listening. And just like affirming the relationship takes much longer than you may think when you begin this conversation with somebody, listening and seeking to understand is much harder than it sounds on the surface. A good way to at least think mentally if you don't actually say these words is, 
okay, hey, uh, you know, Joe, you know, love you, love working with you, and you have a five-minute conversation about how's the family doing. You know, where are we, Joe? Are, are we, you know, together? And through all that, we've affirmed the relationship. I've sensed that Joe is ready to talk about this conflict. The timing's good, so I'm paying attention to his body language. And now, I start by saying, Joe, I'd really like to understand your perspective on this. So explain it to me again. Tell me so I can understand. Just those words, I really want to understand, can go a long way. Now, if you don't say those, at least have the mentality in your mind that, okay, I'm going to listen. I'm going to wait till I think I actually understand his position, which is very different from mine. I disagree with him completely. But I've got to wrestle through understanding why does he think that's the best solution? Why does he want to do it that way? Why did he already do that and upset me when I told him not to do it? Whatever the actual issue is. But seeking to understand, listening is hard work. Stay there for a long time as well. And really try to understand what they're trying to say. So here's four resources that I want to tell you about. The first is the Relational Wisdom, rw360.org. That's Ken Sandy's um, website that has all kinds of great information on dealing with relationships, dealing with conflict, solving problems, and he's consulted many a church and organization and team members on resolving those kind of issues. Second is discoveryreport.com. I forgot to mention this. This is actually a personality assessment profile. Uh, there are no right or wrong personalities. If you're a people person and somebody else is not a people person, one of you isn't, it's not that one of you is right and one of you wrong. You just have different personalities. So it's not a personality test. You can't pass or fail it. It's a personality assessment. Just where are you on all the scales? I personally like this one. It, uh, the way it brings the results back is called DISC. Those are the four main personality type of quadrants they put together. D is for dominant, I is for uh, inspiring, S is for supportive, and C is for cautious, which is the super task-oriented person. And I can tell each of you what you are right now. We'll do a test with Ray. I'm going to ask him two questions, and I can immediately peg him somewhere. And just listening to him, I have a sense of where it is. Ray, are you a people person or a task-oriented person? Task. task. Okay, so I've already put him in half of this quadrant. Next question, are you reserved or outgoing? Outgoing. Outgoing. So he is an actually a D personality. I've taken this test and yeah. I'm a strong, super high D. Right. Yep. So, and, and it explains why he's a consultant. You need to have an outgoing personality to do this type of work. So he's actually in a, a career that fits his personality pretty well. All right, so that's the uh, discovery report. Seven habits is where that seeking to understand, that's one of the habits that Stephen Covey has in his list of the seven habits, which I really like because the first three are about self-management, being self-aware to a degree. The next three habits are about working in teams and with groups of people and how to manage those relationships. And then the seventh one is sharpening the saw. And then the last one, emotionalintelligence.net, that's actually one that I really like. Um, with my employees, you take a DISC personality assessment, the discovery profile, before we hire you, just to sort of make sure our interview process matches the test. And, and then we use it as a tool to remind people, hey, you have a list of everybody's personality, know who you're talking to, especially if a conflict comes up. But emotional intelligence is one we're starting to use more in our company because that's where success actually comes from. Who are the people that are good working with teams because they're self-aware and they're other aware and they act, there's actual skills that you can become better at, uh, at, at all that. So final page with a summary for everybody is picking up the phone, affirming the relationship, knowing and loving these people, and then seeking to understand. Davis, thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be able to, uh, to share these together. And uh, it's, always, it's always the uh, 
speaker that says, okay, where's my presentation here? There we go. So I'd just like to share a little bit uh, from my perspective uh, in, uh, in leadership. And uh, we've been involved in our homeschool journey, which is over, and this is just a picture of, of our son and uh, daughter and son-in-law and some of our grandchildren. Uh, there's, there's all of them, I have to show that. Um, I've, I've had the privilege of standing up a number of times and talking about why I've been involved in what I'm doing. And, and for, for many years I said I didn't do this just for, my, just for my children because I was never concerned that they wouldn't come, af that they would come after me. They wouldn't dare. Um, and not to be arrogant, but I just, the, the possibility was relatively remote. But now looking at it, I would say that I'm not even doing it for these as my grandchildren. It's for their children and the generations that are to come. And looking at that long-term future and, and being able to look at that. I'm from Manitoba. Uh, just to set a little bit of a stage, it's in the middle of Canada. Uh, it's, in a, uh, it's in a place that has two very large lakes that flow into, into Hudson Bay. Why am I telling you those things? Uh, it's a place of winter. Uh, some people, uh, Alberto looks at this and says, how could you live in a place like this? This is, this is just, just recently. Uh, we, we do live in a place where we can go outside and enjoy the, enjoy the cold and do things. And it's, uh, we have a lot of fun, but we, uh, it's great. My grandson, he has the world's largest sandbox. It's, uh, he, he likes to play in the snow, just like playing in the sand and, uh, and has a great time doing it. Uh, but we do have summer. Uh, summer does occur, and this is a picture of uh, of my daughter and I sailing in our in our sailboat with uh, with one of our granddaughters and having a good time doing that. What I'd like to talk to you about is is a little story about because we're in Manitoba, because it's a place that has winter and snow and things. We also have floods. Uh, it's a place where the reason we have floods in Manitoba is that we get everybody's water uh, in Western Canada from the Rocky Mountains uh, in the west of Canada uh, down into the United States. All the water flows through our province. And because of that, we get floods uh, that we deal with. Uh, I'd like to tell you about the biggest flood that we know about. Uh, it happened in the year 2011. So why am I talking about a flood at a homeschool conference? What's this got to do with anything? I think it actually has some lessons for me because a flood is kind of like a lot of things that happen in homeschooling. There's as much planning as you can do. There's a lot of, of strategy, a lot of things that are done, but when it happens, it happens. And things don't always go the way that you figured that they would go. And it requires some modification and resources and those kinds of things. This is a flood that happened in 2011. Manitoba is a place where it's flooded for years and years and years, and that's why our soils are as productive as they are. Uh, the rivers would flood, they would deposit soils in an area, and things would grow very nicely. That's, so it's, it's, it's kind of hard to tell people that there's something good about the flood, but it, it actually is that's why we have productive agricultural land. This is one of our cities in our province, uh, in western Manitoba. It's a place where it doesn't always flood that often. Uh, but it was a battle zone in 2011, and what, what happened in the province was that we always plan for the one river that comes up from, from the United States in North Dakota, and it's the main one that floods. It was supposed to flood a bit. It didn't really flood, but the other river uh, that's the more minor one was the one that flooded in a huge way. Just to give you a perspective, the, uh, the flow in that river was, was two times the flow of Niagara Falls. Uh, normally, it's a river that's probably about... 10 meters across, uh, and it w the magnitude of the water flow was massive. And uh, it was, I don't know how the engineers figured this out, but we got two of them up here that maybe can explain it to me, but we were told it was a, it was a one in 300 year flood. Now we had a one in 100 year flood two years before that, and then we had a one in 300 year flood two years afterwards, so I, I don't know how the math works, but it was a really big flood with lots and lots of water. So what does that mean? Normally our floods last about three weeks uh, at, for, a, for a major one. This flood uh, lasted 100 days, and the, the lake that resulted from it was massive. Uh, a lot of water, a lot of people displaced. Uh, there was uh, three million acres of cropland that were not able to be seeded in that, in that year. So large areas, large effects, and, uh, and a lot of things that, that, that happened. This particular one lake, there's two very large lakes in our province. This, this lake rose by five meters. 
15 feet, so about five meters. So a very large area that was inundated with water, and the water stayed there a very long time and caused a lot of effects, a lot of devastation, a lot of homes, a lot of cottages, a lot of farms that were ruined, and the effects continued for quite a number of years. The damage from this flood cost about $1.5 billion, and it affected uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of uh, 25,000 homes that were affected. So um, what, what we did, uh, we were called into into work to say, okay, we need some help here. Uh, I was working and was placed in charge of some of the coordination to the flood. And uh, we were asked to do some things that we hadn't really done before. Now we do a lot of planning on floods, but this one was just so over the top that it needed extra help, it needed extra people. And I remember uh, being approached, uh, told by the premier of our province, the highest elected official, he said, this was on a Saturday night, and the Premier said, we need to do something to help the people. So we need a way that we can talk to every person, personally, that's affected by this flood. Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and by noon would be good. This was about 7 o'clock on Saturday night. In order to do this, we need to, ha we need to have at least 50 phone lines and 50 computers installed overnight and active and have the staff there uh, by 7 in the morning to be in place and to be able to contact them, let alone knowing who to call. So we called together our little staff group and said to them, we need to do this. And they looked at me and said, you are nuts. You are crazy. This is totally impossible. There's, like, this is Saturday night. All of the employees in the telephone company are, like, gone. And we don't have the foggiest clue who to phone. I had heard at a homeschool conference a speaker who said, there's this question. And the, the question was, I know that you think it's impossible and feel that it can't be done and I know that you don't know the answer, but I think you can do it. Imagine that you could do it and that it could be done. And they looked at me as like, what are you saying? Okay, with that in mind, what would you do? Who would you talk to to get it started? Now, half the people walked away, and I said, okay, let's just, just think about it for a few minutes. We came back together 15 minutes later, and they said, I don't know, how do we do this? How are we going to get all of these phone lines, all of these computers, all of these people contacted within a matter of hours? One of the people said, you know, I've got a friend who has a cottage, and the neighbor, there was somebody that was at their place that was some kind of an emergency guy with a telephone system. I wonder if he would know. We phoned the cottage, they walked over to the neighbor's place. Within 20 minutes, we had the head of the telephone system that said, oh yeah, we got a, we got a database. You just give us the geographic descriptions of where these people live, we'll give, we'll give you the phone numbers. No problem. We said, well, you know anything about getting phone lines connected? And he said, yeah, I like, we, we kind of could help you with that. Within an hour, we had 10 technicians that were called in to come in and connect these 50 phone lines that we needed and the, and the computer connections. We had no clue how we could solve this problem. If we started out by looking at it and saying, this is impossible, it was. It was completely impossible. But by saying and challenging ourselves and saying, but if we could, and actually, the, I think this is the craziest question that I've used a number of times, certainly in homeschooling, but in, in a number of different formats to say, I know it's impossible, but if you could, how would you do it? And it's amazing the, the, the power of just challenging ourselves to be able to say, I know it's impossible. I know you don't know the answer, but if you did know the answer, what would it be? And that question was amazing. There's lots and lots of things that we can talk about and quote about leadership. This guy, Will Rogers, not, one of the leader, not really one of the management gurus, but why not go on a limb? That's where the fruit is. And, you know, we can, we can talk a lot about it. Leaders are, are certainly 
are overrated, but if someone does not follow, they just loan nuts. I don't know how many of you have seen the YouTube video that's on the internet of, of the power of a follower. First follower, you know, and it just, it's, it, it's that graphic representation that that crazy guy dancing out in that field. Yep. Until somebody follows him, he's just a crazy guy dancing out in the field. And then he becomes, then he becomes a leader. I'm not going to go through all of these. A couple of things that I'd like to point out are things that I've learned. And just a couple of books that might help illustrate it. Are you a multiplier or a diminisher? A lot of times I'm a diminisher. A multiplier is someone that uses their smarts to amplify the smarts and capabilities of the people around them. Or are you a diminisher who drains the intelligence, energy, and capacity of others and always needs to be the smartest one in the room? I can, I can very easily be the lowest common denominator. That, I find that really easy to do. To be able to say, I, this is the way I think it should be done, this is my answer, Versus saying, what do you think? What expertise do you have? And how can, we, how can we be that multiplier and be able to have people step up and use their expertise? A book by Liz Wiseman, I think, addresses it well. We've heard a lot about communication and can't do enough of that. But communica communication and conversations, to me, is the, the crux of so much of what needs to happen. There's three ways of handling them. We can avoid them. We can face them and handle them poorly or we can face them and handle them well. How, but how do we separate ourselves enough from the situation to take a step back and not be so absorbed in it that we make it messy? And uh, Kerry Passer, Patterson and a number of others have written just an excellent book on, on some of the things about, about crucial conversations. And the last one is how to build teams. Uh, teams can accomplish so much that individuals can't. And whether we're talking about organizations, businesses, but building teams that need to be effective, Patrick Lencioni, uh, in a storybook format, just really does a great job of talking about what, what some of the functions of teams need to be. And I'm not gonna go through it other than click through the slides here, which I didn't realize it was animated. <laughs> but it's an excellent study. In summary, what I've learned, I can try and do it myself. I could try to figure out how to install those phone lines, but I didn't know the person that knew the person. Teamwork was needed. I can't do it alone. Communication is the key. There's so many times that it comes down to how do I communicate, and I need to, uh, to be able to step up and step out, out of the situation enough to, to let it happen. And I have to regularly ask myself, am I limiting or am I multiplying the, th the things that need to be happening? We'd like to, to spend some time, just a little bit of time in your questions. We've got lots of time tomorrow, but any, any burning or uh, questions that you would just like to, to put forward this evening before we, uh, before we break, we'd like to give a, time, a chance for that. Or Davis or, or Ray, any, any other thoughts or comments that you wanted to make? <laughs> We've had a long day. Um, I've read many of those books that have been recommended by both these gentlemen, and they're very good. Leadert, I'll come over there. Thanks. Uh, just a comment to raise uh, <clears throat> dis uh, distinguishing between homeschoolers and homeschooling leaders. In my experience, there's one thing that they all have in common. And that is being homeschoolers means that they differ on everything except the fact that the education of their children is important to them. And that means that the potential for conflict is unlimited. And that means that you don't ride them with a tighter rein. That's an excellent point. And uh, I've, one of the boards that I was on, the, um, the president of the organization felt that he was president, which was just one step below emperor. Um, and, um, 
uh, it just didn't didn't work well. And, and within three months, he resigned because he the, all of us were strong personalities, all of us were passionate, and we all had good ideas. The the thing I was trying to make a, a, as a clarification between homeschooling uh, homeschoolers and homeschool leaders is that those homeschoolers, the first year or two, they're fragile. They need support and encouragement because they're probably getting a lot of pressure from friends, family, um, church, wherever, to stop this crazy idea. But after a couple of years, when they're grounded, now they're likely to take off and go many different directions. And it's, uh, we were mentioning the, the phrase of, of herding cats, uh, that it can be like herding cats, although I, my experience is that it's worse than that with homeschool leaders. It's more like trying to herd butterflies, which is even worse. Um, I, I uh, so agree with uh, it overstating or overdoing the communication. Um, I recently went through a period of conflict um, that resulted in a split. And I, and I realized that even though there were some situations that led to the conflict that were in place, that not having uh, uh, communicated in different ways, either personally or uh, actually with our executive getting together, we kind of said, oh, we'll do it on social media and only when needed and not scheduling things uh, on a regular basis because we were all busy and whatever um, led to that conflict. So keeping communication, even when you don't have pressing issues to deal with, is uh, so important and can, and can be uh, used to avoid conflict. And I learned my lesson the hard way. Anyone else? If not, I'd like to thank all of our presenters uh, for today. Today was a sort of the introduction, the appetizer. We're getting into more and more in the coming days. But thank you, uh, thank you all, uh, Davis, Ray, and, and everyone else. Uh, this evening is a, a free evening. You're on your own for, for your dinner, but uh, I would encourage you to, to use the opportunity. Yep. Uh, so we're, um, we're adjourned. We'll be back again here at 8.30 tomorrow morning for, uh, for this session. And then the uh, family day also happens tomorrow. That's up on the 10th floor. Uh, that starts at 9. So it's, it's different times. We start at 8.30. They start at 9. They get to sleep in a little bit, I guess. Um, uh, but uh, enjoy your evening. And uh, thank you for your attentiveness and your participation through the day. And we'll see you tomorrow. I hadn't read the Sandy book. I read the other three that you recommended. Sorry.